Coming up on Tech News Today, the Microsoft Surface RT tablet reviews are in. We'll tell you what the internet is saying. Also, uh, complaining begins about the iPad mini. And Facebook, Nintendo, and LG all have earnings. Who made money and who didn't? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, October 24th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by American Express Bank FSB, offering a high-yield savings account, the perfect complement to help you reach your savings goals. To learn more and open an account online, visit personalsavings.com slash online savings, member FDIC. And by We Do Everything in the Cloud. That's why I love my cloud-based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs and Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial and buy one desk phone and get a second phone free up to 20 phones. Call 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And uh, it'll be a week of me wearing Giants hats because of my bet <laughs> with Ryan Block. But this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. Microsoft began shipping its Surface RT tablets for those who pre-ordered them in order to make sure they show up on launch day, October 26th. Reviews of the Surface came out from many review sites. Roughly, the collective internet reviewer mind felt Microsoft has made great hardware, software still needs work, and the App Store needs to expand a lot. AT&T's third quarter earnings are in, and in the last three months, the company shipped 6.1 million smartphones. Mm. 4.1 million of those were iPhones. Net profits fell to 3.6 billion, which is down from 6.8 billion in Q2. But then again, AT&T had a 3.8 billion share buyback scheme, and there's that ongoing cost of building out LTE infrastructure, so they get a bit of a pass. It added 678,000 new wireless customers to its business, making a total of 105.9 million users on the network and has 6.5 billion in safety cash. Safety cash, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Let's see how those BFFs are doing. Of course, I'm talking about the EU and Microsoft. <laughs> EU regulators say that the lack of browser choice in Windows 7 Service Pack 1 could result in charges against Microsoft. Now, Microsoft blamed the lack of choice on a technical error, which it has since fixed. Speaking of browser choice, Reuters reports that the European Commissioner says that there are no grounds to pursue an investigation on the lack of browser choice in Windows RT. Last night, Facebook reported Q3 earnings of $0.12 cents per share on revenue of $1.262 billion, just beating analyst expectations of $0.11 cents a share on $1.229 billion. So that's good news. Mark Zuckerberg and team hammered away to analysts on the earnings call that mobile is not a threat. It's actually to Facebook's advantage. Stock market took the message to heart, drove Facebook stock up over 20% in early trading today. Mm, 24 bucks last I saw. Yeah, looking almost, Over 20 for the first time in a while. It's closer to its IPO price every <laughs> minute. Still has ways to go, though. <laughs> Nintendo has gotten a hold of its operating loss, at least slowing it down a bit. In the April through September quarter, the loss dropped from $718 million to $336 million. Seems like a lot. Con sales sales drew, uh, dropped to about 60%. DS sales uh, maxed out at about 970000 Wii sales hit one3 3.2 million. There is good news for the 3DS, though. Its sales rose nearly 65% to 5 million units, including 2.1 million 3DS XLs. Titles like New Super Mario Bros. 2, Mario Kart 7 helped drive 3DS revenue and 19.3 million games sold overall. Forget about mini tablets. Let's talk about really big phones, okay? The Samsung Galaxy Note 2 is available at T-Mobile but it's going to cost you $370, and that's with a two-year contract. What? Sprint and AT&T offer the same phone for about $300. 
The T-Mobile version is available today. Sprint starts selling it tomorrow, and AT&T starts taking pre-orders tomorrow. In an interview with the Voice of Russia Radio, a hacktivist who participates in the Anonymous Collective mentioned the possible release of WikiLeaks ethical violations and said that Anonymous plans to launch a secure, no-cost, decentralized leaks platform. A platform called Tyler would go live December 21st and provide an alternative to WikiLeaks itself. Crucial security information about the Sony PlayStation 3 has been leaked online. Security experts say it's the equivalent of stealing a master key. The hackers behind the publication of the so-called LVO decryption keys call themselves the Three Musketeers and say that they decided to release the information after it was leaked and fell into the hands of Chinese hackers who were going to charge a fee for the code. In a statement, the group said, you can be sure that if it wasn't, was, hadn't had been for this leak, the key would have never seen the light of day. Only the fear of our work being used to make money out of it has forced us to release us now. Hmm. Okay. LG is selling fewer phones but making more money on them. Uh, LG reported a net profit of 157 billion won. That converts to about $139 million U.S. Mobile division reported a 22 billion won or $20 million operating profit. Last quarter, it reported a loss of 57 billion won. That's 49 million U.S. LG shipped a total of 14 million phones, half of them the higher revenue smartphones, a 9% increase over last year. LG's home entertainment and appliance business both the company as usual with stable profits. Yay, dishwashers. You may have missed something during the Apple press event yesterday. At around the same time as the event, Zynga quietly announced it's cutting 5% of its full-time workforce. You guys are fired. Zynga will report its earnings today, so it does make sense to make an announcement like that the day before. Zynga's Boston studio is being shut down, and 13 games are headed for the sunset. Zynga said it would also back away from The Ville. And they thought we wouldn't report it if they just slipped it in, right? Mm -mm. I don't think that's what they thought. Let's take a break and thank our sponsor for today's show, American Express Bank FSB. Think about all the ways you're you're saving, or you should save. Uh, hopefully, you're becoming disciplined about putting away a little portion of your money on a regular basis. Uh, maybe keeping it in a savings account in a bank. Maybe saving a down payment for a home or car. And hopefully, you're able to set aside some funds for an emergency. Well, whatever your goals for savings are, here's a good place to put your money. An American Express personal savings high yield savings account. It gives you a competitive variable interest rate to help you reach your savings goals. And this is the best part. You don't need to change banks. You can easily link this saving account to your existing bank accounts without having to switch banks. Transfer money back and forth easily depending on your needs and keep track of your balance by phone or web 24-7. No minimum, no fees, includes great phone support. Whenever you want to talk to somebody, you just give them a call. Uh, it's a great compliment. You don't have to replace your bank. Say, I'm not interested in say, changing banks. Just add the American Express Personal Savings High Yield Savings Account. It's an FDIC-insured account offered by American Express Bank. And take control of your finances today. Why, uh, just go check it out. Personalsavings.com slash online savings. While you're there, you can open an account. There's no minimum, no fees, no need to switch banks. All you need to do to get started today is go to American Express's website, personalsavings.com slash online savings. That's a high yield savings account that you can start right now risk free. Uh, without well, risk free in the sense of, of finances, but in other words, you don't have to change your bank. Online savings member FDIC. We thank American Express Bank FSB for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss the technology news around the world, Jeff Bacalar, editor of Games and Gear, and of course, most famous as host of the 404 on CNET. How's it going, Jeff? How are you guys? Thank you so much for having me once again. Good to have you uh, back. I know there's big hockey news today. Uh, I love it. Can you keep your mind on the technology? Sure. There's, there's, yeah, I can, I can behave for a day. Because <laughs> I, 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 we were talking about it all through the pre-show about the the New York Islanders hockey team moving to Brooklyn. Apparently, they're not changing their name though. I saw that on Twitter just now. Well, that's that's okay with me. I said I really wanted them to go as the uh, the Brooklyn Hipsters. I think that would have been <laughs> appropriate for the NHL. Appeal to a different audience, but it's fine. They're still technically on the island. You know who wants to grab the hipsters is Microsoft. They would like all the hipsters to start using the Surface. In fact, it's funny. Uh, I'm not calling Matt Honan of Wired a hipster here, but he did something funny with it when he was reviewing the Microsoft Surface. All the big reviews came out today from, from all the NDAs lifted. So he was talking about how during his review period, he was taking it out. And like going to coffee shops and sitting in the front window, pulling it out on trains, typing, like looking around like, okay, has anybody asked me? Nobody. 
touched it. <laughs> Nobody went up to him and said, "Hey, what is that? Is that the?" And in fact, he said the only person who even commented on the surface was the uh, TSA agent when he was going through airport security. Uh, said, "Oh, sir, you don't have to take your iPad out of the bag." Well, well iPad, I mean, that's you kind of have to give the TSA what? agent a pass. Yeah, They've the, just seen a lot of iPads. Give the TSA through. agent a pass. I agree. Uh, the question is, is this a good or a bad thing that the surface does not attract attention? I mean, it didn't pass the, the hipster sniff test. Mm. We're, just the, we're just the, hey, there's a stranger with a computer thing I've never seen before. I want to know more about it. I mean, if it's not interesting to people, that's... A bad sign, I but think. But it could also be a good thing in that it it does it isn't a weird thing now to have a tablet, and so for Microsoft to get in this market, they don't have to convince people to buy a tablet. People see tablets now and go, "Oh yeah, that's that's a tablet." It's just a matter of convincing them to buy your particular tablet. Yeah, I was going to say that like the, the, the transformer style or the hybrid style laptop is kind of it's, it's been around for a couple of years now. It seems like so when you see a surface that's magnetically clicking to a keyboard, it doesn't seem like it's brand new. The only thing that's going to look different is that you have this tiled interface, and I don't know if, if how uh, Matt was using it on when he was in whatever store. Like, was he tapping the screen? Was he, he said he had the keyboard out? He was, what, tapping was away. The, the, People probably just thought he had a netbook. It or looks a, like it looks yeah. like a laptop when it's put together. So it's 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 not inconspicuous. This was also in Seattle, right? Maybe they're like, eh, seen it. <laughs> <laughs> All that work at Microsoft. Yeah, it's a guy with the surface. Yeah. yeah, it has to do something more to stand out. You're right. It, it, it could be a lot. Think about how all the different kinds of iPad cases and all the crap that's out there, all the accessories doesn't really separate itself. If this I mean, if you had like a hologram on the table, then people start asking him, hey, what do you what do you have there? I'm interested in that. What he's got right now, that service that there's not a big enough difference between all those products. I don't know that if he had the hot pink screen. keyboard. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I would, I guess I would just walk right by that. Uh, well, here's here's my uh, reading of the reviews. Uh, Boing Boing actually had a good uh, collection of quotes from all of the reviews and links out to all the different ones. Uh, the good. Basically, uh, Matt Honan of Wired said it's one of the most exciting pieces of hardware I've ever used. Boy Genius Report uh, said perfect combination of tablet and notebook. People generally seem to praise the hardware, said this is a good, solid piece of hardware. It's well designed. The meh, Joanna Stern of ABC News said, waiting for software and apps to be as strong as the hardware. Uh, Josh Topolsky at The Verge said, I wanted to love this device. Uh, and then the haters, uh, Gizmodo said, should you buy it? No. And TechCrunch said it fails to excel at anything particular in the way that other tablets had. Uh, more substantive comments, Tim Stevens of Engadget said, get some serious work done comfortably. So it seems to be productive in his opinion. And Harry McCracken o over at uh, Time said, Microsoft has proved they're serious. They just need to forge ahead until it's, quote, impressive Period. I, and I think Harry's got the, the, the most nuanced look at this, which is this is a 1.0 device, and it's pretty impressive for that. The Surface RT is a really odd like bird when it comes to this because it's the ARM-based version that, doesn't, that looks like Windows 8 that doesn't have all the apps. So the thing, when you buy the Surface RT, you're hoping that they're going to be apps eventually. There's a bunch of first-party applications, but with the selection being what it is, and you're limited to that, it's kind of a, like, you have to have a like, leap of faith to think, okay, eventually... This will have support. People will make apps for this. But right now, it's kind of like, why would you get one of these? Other than it's Microsoft's first piece of, like, serious hardware. Then again, there are a lot of people who, if you think of, like, okay, the iOS app store has the most apps by far, and everyone touts that as, that's, it's all about the ecosystem and the apps. Uh, how many apps do people use regularly all the time? I'd say uh, probably a dozen that yeah. I, might, I, like, have to have. Okay. So you've got, I don't know, up to 20 apps that you feel like you really, really need. If the apps are done well, I don't know that that's a deal breaker for somebody who really wants a Surface tablet. And that used to be the Android call, right? Until recently, it was always like, well, Android may not have all the apps, but they have the right apps. They have the important apps. Now they've got a, a large enough store that sure. I, I think they're, you can say Android has all the apps, if not, if not every that, single one. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's not important to have apps. I think it you know, makes it a lot more exciting, and you can do new stuff and, and experiment, and it just kind of keeps you interested when your otherwise device might sort of seem a little bit stale. I just don't know that that's a huge deal breaker for someone's, someone who really says, I like the look of this, I like Microsoft, I like the Windows 8 interface, I, I'm in. I think a lot of people are real. I mean, the apps will happen. Like you said, the vital ones will show up. The same thing happened, I remember, with like WebOS, right? When I got a, a Palm Pre, it was like, oh, cool, there's seven apps in the store. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. But then they started fleshing out a little bit. I think, uh, and I was talking to um, um, our, our buddy who reviewed it for, for us, Eric Franklin, 
And, and in his review, he says that it's it's sluggish. And I think that it's a lot simple. You know, people really get turned off by that. And I think that yeah. was the big problem with Android in the beginning. Like, you would swipe, and it wasn't that quick sort of one-to-one -one feel that iOS has been able to master since the get-go. And I think that turns people off right away. Uh, and, I, and it was only up until now with, with Jelly Bean, like how, how smooth Jelly Bean really performs. And it's almost at that silky smooth uh, performance that, that people are used to with iOS. I think that it's, it's, it's a lot simpler. People are really turned off by the fact that this thing maybe isn't as silky smooth as you would want a tablet to be. And what we've been sort of conditioned to, to expect them to be with, with iPads. Yeah, it seems like a couple of things like IE work really well. So they show that you can make the software, but not all of the applications uh, work really well. I, I think somebody said particularly games are really sluggish on it. Uh, so that is, uh, that's, a, that's a knock on it too. Well, Apple had their big announcement yesterday. And the way things go when Apple makes a big announcement is everybody gets overexcited about it once it's been announced. Then they get immediately depressed about it and start picking it apart and complaining. Yeah, that's true. There's there's definitely some complaints uh, so far. Uh, some of the ones that... that uh, I relate to the iPad mini specifically is no built-in GPS on the Wi-Fi only iPad mini, which you, you could say, well, there is no built-in GPS on the Wi-Fi only regular iPad either. And that's true. However, Apple did spend quite a bit of time comparing the iPad mini to uh, the Nexus 7. I mean, even though they didn't call it by name, that's pretty much exactly what they were comparing it to. So if you put the two together, that might be something that could be a deal breaker for somebody. I guess if they don't have uh, something like GPS on a smartphone or they don't feel like they'll always have their phone with them. There's also the, uh, the topic of Siri. Why wouldn't the mini iPad be, or why wouldn't the iPad 2 be able to run Siri if the mini iPad is also has that A5 chip? That was mm, yeah. not really anything that Apple had said was the reason that the second gen iPad couldn't run Siri, but it was sort of assumed, well, it must be sort of a, a, a power thing. That it just can't, it just can't run Siri. Um, so that seems not to be the problem with the mini. Suddenly it can run Siri. Suddenly it can. So, yeah. David, David wrote it and pointed that out. He's like, exactly. okay, liars, what's up with that? Yeah, and, and we get that on iPad today a lot is people don't want to feel left out. Siri is the sort of thing. It's it's kind of cool and people want to play around and <laughs> well, uh, certainly not perfect, but something that's exciting to people. Something else that was sort of exciting, and I feel like we, we, we tried to uh, talk about it a little bit because we were covering the announcement live, but got a little bit buried because there was quite a bit of news was the Fusion Drive. This is coming to the iMacs and the new Mac minis, which is the idea that it's two drives. You've got a solid state drive and you've got a, a, a mechanical drive. Um, so the options that you could get is a 128 gigabyte solid state drive with either a one terabyte or a three terabyte mechanical drive. And we were asking during our live coverage of the event, is this a RAID? Like is how, it a hybrid? How is this working? Or is it two separate drives that are then in a RAID? It's two yeah. separate drives uh, that are managed in OS X. But itself. it's not a RAID. It's its own That's thing. right. Fusion Drive is watching what files and applications that IaaS is running the most regularly, you specifically. Good. But pretty much anybody well, else has really a Fusion Drive, too. There's not enough operating systems ta you know, tailored to me. Exactly. <laughs> so the stuff that you use the most regularly... Uh, goes onto the solid state drive because you can access it really quickly, right? So it's supposed to be snappier. Stuff that you're not referencing as much goes into the mechanical drive. And it's not caching. The data is not being duplicated. If you've got a one terabyte mechanical drive and a 128 gigabyte solid state drive, you have 1.12 terabytes of storage. Right. They're not some sort of an overlap and thing. And it, it actually moves applications That's right. between the drives automatically. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So when does, when does it do that? When, when you're sleeping? <laughs> because it's like, well, you know, I feel like that sort of background, that's got to be a background process that's just going to run the entire time, you know, the entire time you're running your computer. So is that something that you can do maybe when you close the computer, have it sleep? That would be kind of cool. Yeah, that's a good question. Is this happening constantly in the background? How much, you know, pro processor uh, activity is this actually going to take up? Is this something that happens once a day, almost like a backup type thing? It's probably why they have that power nap function mm. in OS X Mountain Lion. Right. I don't know. I, I know that uh, the idea of a hybrid drive in the past has not always gotten really good reviews from people who say these aren't actually working as well as they say they are. But again, if this is running on the software side, if this is OS X being smart about it, it would make sense that you would have a snappier system because of the way that it is 
uh, separating your your often used apps and and apps that you write to. By the way, they all go to the Salt and Straight Drive first, so that, so you can access them quickly. Um, versus the sort of old-fashioned mechanical drive. And Apple's really good at making their operating systems seem faster. So what they're going to do with, with this whole Fusion drive, it's, it, as long as you're not managing anything and it's just taking care of itself, you're going to think it's performing snappier and faster, even though it's not a huge like leap in technology by any means because people have been putting their OSs on solid-state drives for a very long time and putting all their files on a large mechanical drive. It's just a management issue. And if Apple's got made it easy that you don't even have to see two volumes which I think a lot of Apple users probably enjoy. It's mm. it just seems like they're just making everything easy for the for the consumer again, and it's just it's it's a nice little addition. But I'm just kind of curious when that's gonna is that gonna show up in any other machine? Is that gonna be the Mac Mini? Is that gonna show up in the Mac Pro one day if they ever update? That? Well, are they, well, that's Fusion a whole Drive is already so. in the new Mac Minis, yeah. isn't it? Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. iMacs and Mac Minis. Oh, then the new guys. The, the question is, will they ever update the Mac Pro? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, we talked about that a little bit yesterday. Like, no, no mention. A real of it. update, just, not sort just, of a yeah, not a polish. processor tweak or something. <laughs> Which, frankly, all the people getting upset about the iPad Mini or about the iPad 10 inch getting an upgrade, to me, that's that's just a processor tweak. That's all. They, that's all they did. And they changed the and lightning, lightning adapter. Yeah. I, as I know, your first reaction was, "I am mad." I because was burned. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yes. You're. You're. Well, you're exact. Bacalar's mad too. Okay. Well, let's find out what too. Jeff's mad then. I just don't understand why, the, and it, they're sneaky. They know they were going to be burning people, because they and they slid it sort of in. Why didn't they announce it during the iPhone 5 event? They could have done that, right? They could have snuck it in during that. They clearly were like, oh, we're going to burn so many people right now. I but don't get it. I do not get okay, why let's... anyone feels burned. You have an iPad. Okay. You bought it with your own money because you wanted one. It was the best right. you could get at the time. Now, what does this announcement have to do with how much you like your current iPad? Sorry, Jeff, you were saying? I was just saying, like, yeah, I, at the time I wanted it, but I also didn't want to, you know, go five months since I bought the one I have and then be like, oh, you know, by the way, we just refresh this, and it's, it's twice as fast as the one you have right now. I just don't like setting up that relationship with a company. I never like feeling uh, that I've been taken advantage of, and that's – straight up how I feel I, I, I was treated with the uh, with the A3 coming to the fore. Do you now. feel that way when they come out with a new processor upgrade to MacBook Pros? Do you say, ah, oh, I was cheated. I bought a MacBook Pro with the, uh, the slower pro clock speed. Well, how often do they refresh those? They're not every year. About every year. In fact, year. usually what happens is they, 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 it, it, they come out with the processor upgrades and they don't even tell anybody. It just happens. Right. And everyone says, well, that's not a real upgrade. When are they going to come up with a real upgrade to the MacBook it, Pros? It is, and you should feel burned if it's been six months since you no, got a MacBook you Pro. Well, should. So, 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 so a company like <laughs> Apple should say, yeah. you know what, we don't want to upset Jeff, or certainly not <laughs> I as, so well, let's just sit on our technology longer than we need to. Well, here's, here's what I went so through. So we the don't... Fact that they've been able <laughs> The fact that they've been able to convince an entire culture of consumers that pulling this crap every year that they're going to refresh this is okay. And we've all been like, yes, we will swallow that. That's fine. Refresh How this every year. How dare you year. make my product That's faster? Cool. Okay, so the, the fact they're getting away with that and then they try and pull this six-month stuff, that is not cool at all. They, it's amazing. No other company could, could pull that besides car companies, right? Once right. a year, we're going to do this thing. Once a year, brand new. It's better than the thing you got 12 months ago. Don't now, update the cycles. Never. Don't, please don't stop innovate. making things better. Okay. No. I never right. want new you products to come out. You made something better too quickly. I have been wrong. Uh, this this is okay. really interesting. I'm not going to go out and buy it. I'm just saying. It sucks. This is interesting to me because it's kind of it's kind of speaking to something that's close to at least me in the Android world, which is revision updates, right? On one hand, like we, we run all this technology and it's cool technology and it does all this crazy stuff. We want those updates um, on one hand, but on the other hand, it's not okay. Like, why is it good on one side, but it's not good when it comes to OS revisions? You know what I mean? If, 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 when that, like, for instance, when they dropped the price of the iPhone a month after they put it out, right? That pissed that, me that off. That was a big, yes. This, six months later, after I bought a piece of hardware that I'm not complaining about, they put sure, a, a still slightly good faster and processor it still in it well. and changed the connector. I'm like, okay, well, now I don't have to, you know, I don't, I don't have to go buy a bunch of new connectors for that tablet because sure. I've got the old one, and I'm not sitting here complaining about how slow it is. So and it doesn't you, bother me right. at all. You're right, Tom, for sure. I'm not, I, I, my iPad 3 perform, performs perfect. I don't think it's slow by any stretch, 
it's just it's more it's the meaning behind it. It's, it's the, the principle of, of the it's thing. the principle. You know, no one likes being treated like that, especially by this company that seems to not able to do wrong. You know, and that's so. Look, like I said, I'm not going out crazy saying I have to get the fourth one now. It's not about that. It's the principle. You just you just feel wrong that someone improved their product and will sell it to other people. How dare they? I mean, they just get finished saying how this is the best-selling iPad ever, and they looked everyone in the eye, and they're like, this is the best-selling iPad we've ever made. Here's the next one that we just, you know, it's, I don't know, it just That's came off. That's how it goes. Really yes, like, they do. In fact, it goes. frankly, Nintendo needs to be doing that, because they, they had their earnings report yesterday, uh, and they... They can take some tips on on how to sell more things. Yeah, I mentioned in in the news views that I, they've uh, been selling a pretty decent uh, 3ds 3ds uh, numbers. I mean, they're they're kind of steady sales. Although they did have a price drop, which helped too, and they had announced some games that helped um, certainly with the bundles of 3ds and games that were sold. Um, the Wii U uh, new console, of course, the first real new console. In six years, it's going to be available uh, November 18th in North America, gets to Europe a little bit later in the month, December 8th hits Japan. So this is this is the big this is the big Nintendo push. Um, the company says it, it wants, it hopes to sell 5.5 million un units of the Wii U by the end of March. Uh, there's a goal to sell 24 million units of software for the new console. Uh, during the same period, end of March, uh, the basic Wii U model is going to be three hundred dollars in the U.S. Uh, there's a there's a larger memory version for three hundred and forty nine dollars, but they have lowered uh, their fiscal year sales outlook um, for uh, for the 3DS by five percent, knowing that you know there there is steady growth, but it's going to slow down. Also lowered the fiscal year profit outlook by 70%. That's 6 billion yen, which is about 75 million U.S., uh, for the fiscal year that also ends in March, which is off from an earlier projection that was a lot healthier for a profit of 20 billion yen. Also reduced its full year revenue outlook to 810 billion. Uh, the previous target was 820 billion. Of course, that's you know, it's a lot of billions, $10 billion off of that. I wonder, we've, we've talked about this ad nauseum. The idea of Nintendo really sticks to its guns and says, we still want to provide a product for gamers who just don't think uh, tablet and smartphone gaming is the same thing as a dedicated console. And you got to, I mean, kudos to Nintendo for, for, sticking, for sticking to uh, their guns on that. But Especially we've now got the iPad Mini. Let's say it sells really well. iPad Mini can run all the same games that the iPad can. You've also got the market pretty much flooded with tablets. Let's go Android. Let's talk Windows tablets. Yeah, there aren't as many games on the Windows tablets, but I think that that will change. It seems like Nintendo is going into even shirkier waters than ever before. I mean, this particular holiday season, it's more and more diluted at this point than even it was a few months ago. I just... I don't know. I, I think it looks bleak, quite frankly. Even though they've lowered their forecasts, they know that they have to, and I still think they're being optimistic. Well, I think that's because, I mean, there's that, that's a good motivator for Nintendo to go into that Nintendo television world where they decided to go, okay, look, everybody else has the all-in-one entertainment box. What do we have? We have this casual gaming box, and we kind of have things in the Wii, and we can kind of make things different. But with the Wii U, they're like, okay, well, everyone's going to have a tablet, and everyone's going to do these kinds of gaming things, but we need a killer function, and that's... Right now, I think trying to figure out online television might be where Nintendo ends up going in some kind of like pivot at some point. Because I wouldn't think of Nintendo a long time ago as just a handheld maker. That's really what they, their bread and butter is right now. But if they can keep expanding what they're doing with their console, kind of like what Xbox did and what the PlayStation did, that might give them a lot more lifespan than they probably would have if they just stuck to their guns and going, well, we have gameplay and we have Mario. It's like, no, we have the way to actually watch television online on your television. What do you uh, think, uh, Jeff? Is is this doom for Nintendo when they're launching the savior product that's supposed to like replace the declining Wii sales? They're forecasting downward. I mean, they ha they have a lot of work ahead of them. I feel I just feel bad talking about it because I just I don't like seeing a video game company struggle like this. It's it sucks, but I think the first thing they have to do is somehow convince people that they need to buy a Wii U, even though their Xbox 360 or their PlayStation 3 that they already own will play more than half the games that the Wii U's debuting, right? So they have to be like, all right, 
You can play this brand new game that just came out on 360 on our... So it's like, why am I buying a Wii U if I can already play these games? I think what you guys said about the, the whole TV thing, it's it's interesting because they're, they're kind of underplaying that, especially when they had their uh, debut, you know, their price and date announcement in New York in September. They said, you know, the, the Wii, the Nintendo TV thing was almost like an afterthought. And we're sitting there and we're like, all right, so they're basically coming out and saying we're going to have the best universal remote control that that you can get, you know, and on paper, it sort of seems better than something like a Harmony remote or something like that. So that stuff I think is intriguing and they're maybe underselling that. A lot of people tell me I'm crazy that that's like the main selling point for the Wii U, but just looking at it completely uh, um, objectively, it sort of is. It's sort of the, the, the best thing it's got going for it. Um, they said it's going to control all your devices. So like your receiver, your television will change sources. It's basically going to become this like always on controller that, you know, you pick up not just because you want to play a Wii U game. So I think they have to really enforce that as well. I don't know. It, it's very, very, it's a tough, tough uphill battle they have. I think going strategically speaking, where they've positioned this launch the, right before Black Friday, they're just going to sell units based on that alone, based on that momentum, I think. Um, I still think their projections are maybe a little too uh, ambitious, but it's it's going to be a really really strange ride in, yeah. from the uh, the gate. I yeah. think that one can deny that. I think it's really uh, it's really unsettling to think that with the launch of the big product, Black Friday, like you say, built in sales factor that they're talking about revising sales down, and that you you even think they're still too optimistic at that point. Yeah. Let's, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Ring Central. When we built the studio here at Twit in Petaluma, we chose to do as much as we could through the cloud, store documents, hold meetings. We did not want to get one of those big, complicated PBX systems in the basement to handle phones. I mean, we got we all have cell phones with us already. We all have laptops that are connected. Why, why do we need to string wires everywhere? So Russell, our IT guy, said, get a cloud-based phone system through Ring Central. It was a no-brainer. We love Ring Central. Zero startup costs, no PBX hardware to install or maintain, and Ring Central allows us to easily customize all of our call handling. Our producers love getting their voicemail in their email, and we can even get fax messages on our smartphones. When those annoying people say insist on sending us faxes, it's not a problem anymore. So Ring Central offers all-inclusive pricing as low as $20 a month per user, and you can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial and get this special offer for our listeners. When you buy one desk phone, get a second phone free, and you can do it if are up to 20 phones. So call this number, designated for our listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980. Once again, 800-543-9980. Or you can also go to ringcentral.com and use promo code TWIT, Ring Central. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. It's earnings week. We talked about that on the calendar uh, earlier this week. Facebook had their earnings uh, and profits, as I mentioned in the news feud, uh, beat the street. Uh, depending on what headline you looked at, they either like shocked the market with their amazing results or they met expectations uh, and got a little bit better. But they, they were technically above what analysts expected. Uh, Zuckerberg came out strong in the earnings call said, I want to dispel this myth that Facebook can't make money on mobile. And they just hammered away on that point because that's been the big criticism, as Sarah was talking about the other day. Uh, they said the company has 1.01 billion monthly users and a seventh of the entire world's population uses Facebook. 604 million of those were accessing Facebook by smartphone. 14% of Facebook's advertising revenue now comes from mobile devices. That was $150 million this quarter. Ad revenue accelerated 36%. And, and Zuck said mobile is misunderstood. Quote, I believe over the long term that we're going to see more monetization from mobile than over the desktop. Uh, looking at the, the story that you did the other day, Sarah, they did pull a couple of those ways to make mobile out and, uh, and talked about them. They pushed sponsored stories as one of their key mobile strategies, saying that the ads built into news feeds are eight times more engaging. And they also talked up using ads for apps in the news feed for mobile. Uh, and then they, they po took a poke at Zynga. Uh, quote, the reality is that there are actually two different stories playing out here regarding game apps on Facebook. The rest of the games ecosystem has actually been growing. Of course, this right after Zynga uh, announced those layoffs. layoffs. Uh, there, so Facebook is basically saying, don't look at Zynga as the model for how games are going to perform on our platform. Exactly. And, uh, and just hammering away that essentially 
we think that that which does not kill us makes us stronger. And because mobile is such a big opportunity and so many of our users are going there, that just means we're going to make all kinds of money off them because we're integrating monetization in every product we make. Uh, what, what do you think? Jeff, do you, do you think that, 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 I mean, the market seemed to react positively to this, but do you think that Facebook is right? That because so many people are on mobile, it's, it's a layup from talking about my earlier mistakenly said word for them to, to get profits off of people. I mean, there's, it's, it's almost like they, they have to just convince everyone that that's what, where, where they're going. I, th I mean, you, you, if they can't monetize that, it's sort of this, you know, gigantic powerhouse that just won't make money. Uh, you know, that's the future. That's exactly what they have to do. But convincing that to shareholders may not be as easy of a sell as, you know, saying, hey, you know, there's, there's a billion people on our service. And they go on, you know, they, they use it every day. It's that mobile cell. I feel like maybe people, uh, market people, aren't exactly, you know, seeing eye to eye with that yet. Facebook, though, think about this. 14% of Facebook's advertising revenue comes from mobile devices. At the beginning of the year, there was no advertising on mobile devices. Now they're at 14%. They have $150 million that they just didn't even have a chance to make before. Now, this is Facebook. $150 million is not going to run a company, but it is a trend in the right direction. Yeah, they said on the earnings call, $150 million, that's no small potatoes. <laughs> Kara Swisher on All Things D said, actually, those potatoes are kind of small. They are but, extremely but small. They're, but it's good that you have potatoes. Yes. Yeah. The thing about Facebook is that they're putting, they're, their mobile strategy is huge right now to the point where they're, they're having the little Java-based versions of their application so they can give away internet for free. Like all kinds of bizarre things to get people on Facebook, even if they don't normally have the, the, the standard uh, venues for accessing Facebook. So if they can just get a small chunk of money from these a billion people. It's the other thing. Like you think about Kickstarter, it's like, give me a dollar. You, know, you can make something. They have a billion people using their service. So if they can serve ads to these these uh, their users, they can make a ton of money. So if, like like you're saying, Sarah, from zero to 14, they have nowhere to go but up. They have a little dance to, to do too because as they're talking to the analysts, like, we're putting ads everywhere. Don't worry. The news feed is going to be filled with ads. All of a sudden they're like, but of course we're monitoring this very carefully to make sure that the uh, the users don't get upset about that because, you know, we, 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 yeah. we, users, plug your ears for yeah. a second. Don't listen to that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I did think it was interesting, uh, that poke that they took at Zynga in light of the layoffs. And, and I, as you were looking into that story, mm -hmm. uh, the timing of it is interesting because it's during an Apple announcement. What what else do we know about it? Okay, so TechCrunch had a whole bunch of things behind the scenes. They got they checked some, with some sources, and uh, for, for this for the stats, we got Zynga cutting five percent, and that's a roughly around 170 employees out of a job. 13 games are going away, significantly reducing investment at the Vale. The Boston office is shutting down. Uh, but the the backstory is that uh, no, but the rank and file employees didn't know anything about this until the morning of, so yesterday. Uh, the senior VP of games came to the Boston office to tell the studio, 50 people. You're being shut down. So they had, nobody had any idea what was going on. The Boston office was working on a game that apparently Zynga internally was very excited about. That game is now dead. Oh. So they're, they're doing that. The Ville is no longer going to have a ton of investment. This is from uh, the official letter from uh, the CEO. And obviously a lot of this is about making Zynga profitable, right? Because Facebook knocks them. They're saying, okay, they're not making money. That's not a reflection of us. Not at all. That's not what's going on. And if games are growing on Facebook... Does this mean that Zynga is going to finally have like a wake-up call and say, hey, making knockoff games like The Ville, which is The Sims, except, effectively, is not the way to go anymore. We need to do something new because Farmville was somewhat new, but now it's like they just keep going back to the, the well. Are they going to change or are we just going to see, we got less people, we'll do the same games? Well, Zynga grew really quickly, right, under the premise that this was a business model, not a fad. And I, I don't think that just gaming in general and the Zynga model is worth nothing, but Zynga was pretty bloated. So, and as anybody who's gone through layoffs before, we kind of talked about it during the announcement, like Zynga fired a hundred people during the announcement in hopes that nobody would know about it. It's like layoffs tend to happen out of the blue. I mean, it's not like the company's going to be like, heads up. In a few days, we're going to fire you. Start getting your things together now. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. So bad timing, but then uh, it kind of makes sense when you think about Zynga's earnings. This just, this is inevitable. If Zynga wants to succeed, they have to downsize. 
They're they're not making the kind of money that they should be making right now. They're paying too many people. It's math. Jeff, do you think that, that Zynga's going to try some serious games, or are we just going to still see these little cutesy Farmville stuff? Oh, I, I, I really hope not. But, yeah, I, I, um, I don't think they will, unfortunately. I think they're going to continue doing what they're doing. I just think they're realizing that it's not about it, – it's really all about, like, the one-hit wonders for them. And I think they didn't realize the, the turnover rate. You know, they, they seem to have all the big staples for a little while, but now people are much more fragmented, and they're all over the place in terms of casual gaming. So I think they maybe learned a few things, uh, like, you, like you said, with, uh, you know, making uh, the knockoffs and stuff like that and paying other companies ridiculous amounts of money for their games. So uh, I think – with that, they're going to learn that maybe they need to increase their turnover. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, you know, these games don't have to be as epic as maybe Farmville was in terms of complexity. Uh, and they're going to have to make do with a lot less people program these games. That's for sure. You know, the fundamental principle here is game, people don't play games forever. Right. Yeah. And so when Mafia Wars was a big hit, everybody started to think maybe it'll never end. Maybe people will play Mafia Wars forever. Maybe people will play Farmville forever. Maybe it'll be the game that's different. And no one people stop playing games. And now these were unusual in that they were they were very addictive and people played them a lot longer than they might play through like a first person shooter with a beginning, middle, and end story. But eventually people stop playing games. And 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 Zynga, I think, overestimated just how addictive their games would be and how much people would want to stick with a game or move from game to game. I mean, a lot of video, successful video games right now are franchises like Madden and the sports games. People will continue mm -hmm. buying as long as you change it every year, I guess. Right. So you have to have even World of Warcraft is kind of the same game, but they still offer World of Warcraft new is definitely extensions. the exception that right. proves the rule, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, think about how many games are still, like you said, how many games are still relevant that are older than, you know, six, seven years. You have like Games like Counter Strike, people still go nuts for that. World of Warcraft. I mean, you can. Re it's only like a sort of handful of games that have a very devoted and loyal fan base. Uh, it's a, it's tough. It's a short list. Yeah, you 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 had what what Zynga needs to do, in my opinion, is is become that. What you're talking about, Ayaz, that that sort of series of games, like okay, now that you're tired of Farmville, check out this, and that's what they've been trying to do with the Ville and all these things. It just they haven't they haven't cracked it yet. It's because those games already existed. That's yeah. the problem. <laughs> Stop ripping people off. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, let's finish up with the Netflix earnings call. Uh, not so much to talk about the earnings as much as to talk about some of the cool things Reed Hastings says. Yeah, Reed Hastings <laughs> in the letter to the shareholders. This is a, a fun thing. I mean, there's some numbers, and and Netflix got some some new subscribers, and good for them. N nothing spectacular. From Netflix, but uh, Peter Kafka was taking a look at the uh, letter to the shareholders, and he thinks that Amazon is actually making headway against Netflix because of the careful phrasing of what Amazon, uh, how Amazon's position is uh, compared to Hulu. Uh, that also on HBO, uh, Reed Hastings thinks that HBO is a bunch of liars. They are going to come out with their own direct-to-consumer uh, service in the United States and become more of a competitor. That is our operating assumption. So they're assuming HBO is coming. So. We all want to believe that, I think. Yeah. Um, Good, Reed. I hope you're right. And also that Hulu is actually Netflix's biggest U.S. competitor. So it's a totally different service, totally different style of service, but apparently this is what Netflix thinks they need to worry about. Although TV Everywhere, that whole thing where you sign up with your cable, authenticate, implication is that even the best TV Everywhere isn't yet attractive to Netflix viewing uh, at all. So Netflix members don't want it. So... What, what do we think about what Reed is saying? Do you think HBO is going to come out with their own their own service finally, or is this some like thing that Reed is afraid of? I, I think I think he's right that he ha he has to act as if they are because if he acts as, as if they if they aren't and they do, he's screwed. If he acts as if they are and they don't, he's fine. So that's just smart. I also think that Hulu is their main competitor, even though it's a different service, and actually because it's a different service. We think of it as the same thing. We talk about Netflix and Hulu. Mm -hmm. What are the things that are on the the Roku box or the Apple TV? I want Netflix and Hulu. Uh, and and if you're going to cut down your monthly eight dollar a subscription, eight dollar a month uh, internet subscription, you're going to pick between Netflix and Hulu, and you're going to make that choice based on the differences between them. What do you guys think is the the sweet spot price point for uh, for an HBO a la carte sort of service? Because I, I feel like. You know, this whole time I'm like, oh, I've I've been sort of conditioned to believe that they can't do it for some legal reason because they are distributed on cable providers. But I don't know why I think that. But so if they were to come out with their own thing, 
what what would that price point have to be? It would obviously have to be cheaper than what it costs to uh, subscribe in cable. Yeah, so, well, and, and the thing is, what I have come to understand is the reason they're reluctant to do it in the U.S. is because all of the carriers that get, give you HBO, all the cable companies, provide loads of free advertising. All those advertisements you see when you're watching television for HBO are given free by your mm -hmm. cable or satellite provider. And the value of that is so big that going direct to the consumers would lose them that. The cable companies are like, look, if you if you go direct to consumers of the internet, forget getting free ads from us anymore. And they don't want to do that yet. But at a certain point, the calculation is going to change and it's going to be worth it for them. And so it's a matter of what the consumers will pay. I think consumers will pay $15, $20 a month for HBO, I'd at least at the beginning. easily pay $20 a month for HBO. I mean, that's also because there are a lot of series on HBO, even though some of them are on uh, hiatus right now, that I love. HBO is, a, is, is the strong, strongest brand to me by far. I'd mm -hmm. happily pay $20 a month. I'd probably pay $25. See, I think $15 or $20 would be great. But then again, HBO can make so much more money by offering downloads. Like season passes cost like what, $35 a piece for each series. So if yeah. they can make mm -hmm. that kind of money, that's the kind of money grab I would expect from HBO. Not this really consumer friendly $15 and watch whatever you want. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. But they could make a lot more money just by selling their shows. Well, if you want to get more money to be able to afford any kind of future service like HBO, you might want to go to Gazelle and uh, sell your old gadgets. You want the new iPhone? You want the new iPad mini? Before you get the new one, make sure you sell your used phone or your used tablet to Gazelle for cash. Cash you can use to upgrade. Gazelle's simple and fast. Just go to G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Tell Gazelle the condition and do it fast. We know that the price that they're going to be able to pay for iPads is going down as more people are ditching their old iPad to get these new iPads that came out. So don't wait. This is what Gazelle does to help you out. Lock in a price for 30 days. You go to Gazelle right now and you say, I want to sell my iPad and you lock in that price, they will they will honor that price for 30 days. So you have 30 days to decide, risk-free, whether you really want to sell it or not. When you do decide to sell, print out the shipping label. They pay for the shipping. You send it off to Gazelle. Once they get the item, they investigate it. In a couple of days, you got cash either by PayPal or by check. It is the simplest way to get cash for your old gadgets, uh, and I've done it over and over and again. And again. It, just, it saves me time and makes me money. I love it. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot -E com. Sell your used iPhone or your iPad today. And we thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar? Well, Apple and Amazon both have earnings reports tomorrow. That's October 25th. Uh, the Kindle Fire, the Kindle Fire HD, and the Kindle Paperweight have launched in Japan. Use along that paperweight. Paperweight. <laughs> God, I did it again. <laughs> I'm really not doing that on purpose. It's just... <laughs> It's sorry. hard to avoid. I'm sorry, Amazon. I love you. Paper white in Japan. <laughs> Alongside a new Japanese language Kindle store. The paper white is also coming to the UK tomorrow, starting at uh, 109 pounds sterling. The Samsung Galaxy Note 2 is coming to Sprint for $299.99 tomorrow as well. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I just I got really excited about the midnight <gasps> Microsoft launch of Windows midnight. 8 in New York City. Tomorrow as well. <laughs> and finally, HP has priced its NVX to Windows 8 convertible at uh, $849 uh, with a November 14th release date. Yeah, so that one's not coming out on October 26th with everything else. Well, that's yeah. the awesome one. Yeah, and it's a little, a little it's pricey. Like, it's I still aluminum, like it, it's, though. It's a... Uh, very pretty. Yeah, and it's uh, it's Windows 8, and right? And it comes with the dock. That's, that's the thing. That's the thing. It comes with the keyboard dock. It's pretty nifty. All right, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. I uh, got a voicemail. We were talking about multiple logins as something people would like to have, and there's a rumor that we'll hear about that as part of stock Android on Monday during the Google announcement. But our, our caller says, that's old hat. Multiple logins. Been doing that for years. Hey Don't guys, call it a comeback. We're talking about Android 4.2 possibly getting announced next week and how it could have user switching. And I thought it's worth calling out that Windows 8 obviously has user switching because all versions of Windows have had it. But in Windows 8, it actually works pretty well. I was playing around with it on my Windows 7 tablet. And when you download an app, it's available to every user on the machine. You don't need to buy extra copies. Uh, you can easily set it up so that each person sees different apps. And I was wondering if any of you have played around with it and if you think that's a compelling reason to get maybe a Windows 8 tablet over uh, an existing Android tablet or an iPad. Anyways, love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. That's interesting. Uh, also, we got an email from someone pointing out that the Sony Tablet S has had user switching 
in Android. It was a customization that Sony provided, so that's been out there for a while. Uh, but yeah, well, I, I, how stupid am I? Microsoft, they've been doing user switching forever, and, and it's there in Windows 8 as well. Well, yeah, but the thing is about Microsoft products is they're usually very expensive to get that operating system. Even the education discount's pretty expensive versus Android, flat out free. So if you, it's, it's, I think, just a cost proposition at that point. But yeah, Windows 8 and Windows has had, and every like modern operating system has users and logins. Speaking of multiple logins, Mac Moraniak writes in and says, take a look at the Kuno. It's not a multi-user manager, but it's a full Android device with ice cream sandwich for your school. I work at an Iowa school in the tech department. Uh, we're looking at possibly buying over 500 devices. Wow. This looks like a good system. If you go to mykuno.com, that's K-U-N-O. Uh, we're visiting a nearby school that's already uh, running the Kuno system, implemented uh, pretty soon, sometime next week. Let us know what you think of it once you uh, check out how the other school is using it. But, yeah, if yeah, anyone's interested the, it, in this it, stuff. It definitely looks intriguing. We'll, it have to, we'll have to take a look at that. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Appreciate that. Uh, and thank you guys for submitting stories in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, where we go to look at what you guys say we want to talk about. We look at all kinds of sources and, and try to give you stuff maybe you didn't know you wanted to hear about. But we always look at this to find out, okay, with what's bubbling up on the subreddit. So go there, submit stories, definitely vote on the stories that have been submitted. Let us know what things you would like to hear us discuss. Jeff Bacalar, man, always a pleasure. Thanks uh, for joining us. Great to hear your insights. My pleasure. Thank you guys for having me again. You want more Jeff Bacalar in your life? You can get it at the 404.cnet.com. Uh, what, what, what time is the 404 on? You guys still doing it live, right? Yep. Uh, every day at 12 p.m. Eastern. And uh, on days when I'm not on TNT, it goes to one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So definitely check that out. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web at twit.com. Dot TV slash TNT. You can email us TNT at twit.tv and give us a call. Leave us a voicemail 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Scott Johnson from the Frog Pants Network. We'll see you then. Today. No. La ti da. Everybody's better than dancing. It's fine. Mm. You can dance if you want to.